Until the end, or so I muted it. Oh, and then let me unmute it and see if it works again. Okay, so that was a oh, oh, yeah. Thank you. 
this is live, right? This is. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2021 Six Sinisvet Memorial Lecture on Race Relations and Human Solidarity. Um, I hope you've had a chance to read a little bit about SIG on the welcome slide, and I invite you to take a photo off it if you'd like to follow up on the links at the bottom, um, or you can get in touch with any of the history faculty to get those links emailed to you. Um, my name is Ann McPherson, and I have the honor of chairing the Department of History, the same position that SIG Sinisvet held from 1969 to 1974. SIG served in the Pacific in World War II, got an education on the GI Bill after the war, taught high school, and then got his PhD and found his way to Brockport. His research and teaching were on the white supremacist backlash against progress toward racial equality made during Reconstruction and on the subsequent civil rights movement. It was because he believed in the validity of African-American studies and that discipline's importance to students of color and all students that he helped to found Brockport's Department of African and African-American Studies in 1970. Sig also hired the generation of historians who went on to hire most of the current Brockport history faculty, many of whom make the histories of race, racism, and racial justice central to their teaching and scholarship, whether on the US or on other parts of the world. Those faculty in turn hired our newest history professor, Dr. Elizabeth Masaryk, who will introduce tonight's Sinisvet speaker, Dr. Allison Parker, who is one of Brockport's own, as Elizabeth will explain. But before I turn things over to Dr. Masaryk, let me thank all of you for being here. Um, and I especially want to thank everyone at the union who helped to get us ready for tonight and who is working the event tonight. I want to welcome Brockport students, those who got to know campus in normal times before the pandemic, who came to campus either virtually or in person for the first time during earlier parts of the pandemic, and those of you who are new to campus this semester, welcome to all of you. And also to Dean Joe's Maliakal from the School of Arts and Science, um, where's Joe's? Over here, right. Um, to Chief Diversity Officer Demita Davis and to President Heidi McPherson, thank you all for being here. I know you have very busy schedules. Welcome to faculty and colleagues from across campus. I've seen a bunch of you as you've been coming in. Um, to campus visitors and to alumni, um, several wonderful alumni are with us tonight, and also to emeriti faculty, including our newest history professor emeritus, Dr. Bruce Leslie. Where are you, Bruce? Um, um, Bruce retired last year, and Bruce was hired in 1970 by SIG Sinisvet, the year that SIG doubled the size of the department, something that is kind of uh, very much in the past. Um, but Bruce, I feel like you being here is like a, a link between the generations, so it's just wonderful that you're in the room with us. Um, SIG and Nadine Sinisvet's daughters are watching remotely this evening. Um, and within a week or so, you'll be able to go to our Timelines blog, our departmental blog, um, in order to see a recording of this evening's event. Um, after Allison gives her lecture, there will be time for Q&A and discussion, and we very much want you to engage with her. Um, so I encourage you to, to do that. And so now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Elizabeth Masaryk, our specialist in the History Department on Race and Gender in Modern U.S. History. Good evening. It's lovely to see so many people here tonight. My name is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Garner Masaryk. I am an assistant professor of history here at Brockport, and it is my utmost pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Parker, who is a historian of women and gender, race, and the law in the United States. Her talk today will focus on prominent civil rights activist Mary Church Terrell and how Terrell's early life in the post-Reconstruction South shaped her activism and leadership in the Black freedom struggle in the first half of the 20th century. As many of you in the audience know, Dr. Parker was a dynamic part of the SUNY Brockport campus for 19 years. Professor Parker previously served as chair of the Brockport History Department and as Brockport's College Senate President. While a faculty member at Brockport, she was awarded the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research and Creative Activity. Dr. Parker was also an Andrew W. Mellon Advanced Fellow at the James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference at Emory University. Dr. Parker is currently the History Department Chair 
and Richards Professor of American History at the University of Delaware. She serves as the founding editor of the Gender and Race in American History book series for the University of Rochester Press, and she is co-chair of the Anti-Racism Initiative at the University of Delaware. Dr. Parker is the author of three books, her latest being Unceasing Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell. She is co-editor for three additional books and has published numerous academic articles which examine the intersections of gender, race, and politics in the late 19th and early 20th century. I first became aware of Dr. Parker's vast body of work while doing my own research on 19th century activist and author Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who Parker has also written extensively about. Dr. Parker's analysis of Harper's activism was helpful in developing my own understanding of this 19th century trailblazer, as well as to develop a more sophisticated understanding of Black women's activism and reform work uh, during America's Gilded Age. When I applied for my current position here at Brockport, I must admit that I was a bit intimidated when I learned that the job I was applying for was the one that Dr. Parker was vacating as she moved on to the University of Delaware. Those were some really big shoes to fill. Um, Allison, I know and I've heard firsthand from many of your colleagues how valued you were as a faculty member here. And I'm also astounded at my dumb luck that you were moving on right as I entered the job market. So thanks. Um, <laughs> but of course, not just out of personal interest, but for the sake of our students here at Brockport, I want to thank the college administration, especially the president and the dean for, um, you know, for filling Dr. Parker's position so that Brockport students can continue to pursue rigorous study of women and gender history and the intersection of gender, race and politics that is so central to American history today. So again, I want to thank you all for being here tonight, and now I am happy to invite Dr. Allison Parker to the podium. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here tonight, and it's wonderful to see most of your faces, part of your faces, out in the audience tonight. Um, I think that we've established that I am farther than six feet away, so I will take my ma mask off, which I hope will help with, uh, you know, giving this talk in a way that you can actually hear it. Um, I'm really, really honored to be here, and I want to thank Dr. Ann McPherson for inviting me and for the new women's historian, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Masaryk, for organizing my visit. It's really a special honor to be here as the Sig Sinisvet lecturer. I actually organized quite a few of these lectures while I was a faculty member at Brockport and had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know the entire um, or not the entire, but the family, the Sinisvet family, including Nadine Sinisvet, Barbara Sinisvet Karas, and Dee Johns. And so it's really great to be back at SUNY Brockport, where I did spend almost two entire decades, and they were very happy ones. So this is a wonderful thing. Um, what I want to do tonight is slightly different, I guess, from what was advertised. Um, I decided to give you uh, a kind of overview of why I decided to call the book Unceasing Militant and the trajectory of Mary Church Terrell's life. But I'd like to start by giving you just a quick overview of highlights about who Mary Church Terrell was, just in case you don't happen to know. She was born enslaved in 1863 in Memphis, Tennessee during the Civil War and lived until 1954, the year uh, that the Supreme Court issued its landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. And during her life, she accomplished many firsts. Terrell was, among other things, one of the first black women in the US to earn a bachelor's degree in 1884 from a predominantly white college, Oberlin, and then a master's degree soon after. She taught in the most preeminent black public high school in Washington, D.C., and became the first black woman appointed to the District of Columbia's Board of Education. And Terrell also became the first president of the new National Association of Colored Women, or NACW, in 1896. Furthermore, she was a founding member of the National Association for the Colored People, or the NAACP, in 1909. 
She was also a paid speaker on the black and white lecture circuits, a journalist, and a leader of a successful boycott and a lawsuit against segregated restaurants in the nation's capital much later in the 1940s and 1950s. Unceasing Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell gets its title from the black radical activist and singer actor, Paul Robeson, whose 1954 eulogy of Terrell commemorated what he called her unceasing militant struggle for the full citizenship of her people. Some writers have argued that Terrell was less confrontational or radical earlier in her career and only moved to direct action when she was in her 80s because she felt she had less to lose and was frustrated by the lack of progress on her cherished civil rights goals by the post-World War II era. But I argue that Terrell was not newly radicalized in her old age and instead from early on, she bravely challenged segregation and engaged in direct action uh, protest tactics. Black women were at the vanguard of the battle against the forces of white supremacy and anti-black racism at the turn of the century. In fact, the NACW was the first national secular black organization, not just the first one for women. And it laid the foundation for black political activism in the 20th century. Now in this slide on the far, um, I guess it's my left, uh, that's Mary Church Terrell with the fle uh, feathers in her hat. And then uh, seated over on the ground, um, second over is Ida B. Wells Barnett. Ida B. Wells Barnett's baby is above, that's Charles Barnett. And then above uh, the woman holding the baby is Alice Dunbar Nelson, who's another um, major uh, writer and activist. So these are a pretty amazing group of women and they were all part of this NACW. At their first convention in uh, 1896, the NACW delegates vowed to, in their words, denounce lynchings and recommend the passage of laws requiring counties to pay large fees and fines to the state and full indemnity to the family of the persons lynched. So what they were advocating was for a form of reparations to families of lynch, lynching victims. And this is in 1896. In addition, they denounced segregation and opposed the convict lease labor system that had spread throughout the South by that point, where black Americans charged with small infractions faced long prison sentences and heavy fines that they couldn't pay. So then white farmers and factory owners and others would pay their fines and in exchange force them to work in truly inhumane conditions to so-called pay off their fines. Um, and when she was elected NACW president in 1896, Mary Church Terrell was pregnant for the third time and her well-being was an issue as she faced continued tragic losses surrounding reproduction. Throughout the meeting, Terrell silently coped with the stress and anticipation surrounding her pre pregnancy, which later ended with the birth of a living infant who died within days in a segregated hospital. Terrell poured her heart and her energy into her role as NACW's first president after the loss of that child. And in an NACW presidential convention speech, she pointed out that African-American women of all classes experienced institutional and daily racism, including obstructed access to education and employment. They also experienced health disparities and disproportionate maternal and infant mortality. Terrell knew of the latter danger from personal experience and highlighted disturbing race-based disparities, saying, the health of our race is becoming a matter of deep concern to many who are alarmed by the statistics showing how great is the death rate among us as compared with that of the whites. It is unacceptable that these terrible racial health disparities for black women and their infants are still as true today. 
Terrell's encouragement of young black women to enter nursing and medical schools reflects her recognition that African Americans needed quality health care from well trained professionals who had a vested interest in their survival and ability to thrive. To raise fit and thriving children, Terrell argued, black mothers needed assistance and training and institutional support like daycare programs. Establishing day nurseries is clearly a practical charity for the infants of working women, she said, which would not only save the life and preserve the health of many a little one, but it would speak eloquently of our interest in our sisters whose, life, whose lot is harder than our own, but to whom we should give unmistakable proof of our regard, our sympathy, and our willingness to render any assistance in our power. Urging the women to raise money for institution building, Terrell took the initiative and established the very first NACW fund to build kindergartens across the country as the best way of helping black working class women and their children. Her maternalist focus and appropriation of the rhetoric of domesticity was inherently subversive because Black women were perceived by most whites as either unsexed domestic laborers, mammies, or as over-sexualized and impure, but definitely not as caring, concerned mothers of their own children. Pointing to initial progress for the NACW, especially to their institution building, meaning the establishment of old age homes, uh, schools, and kindergartens in cities around the nation, organized, as Terrell put it, by our women from whom shackles have only recently fallen, we have done much to show our women uh, the advantage gained by concerted action. Having succeeded in growing the new organization into a powerful force for putting civically engaged black women on the national stage, and, uh, and soon after she had given birth to Phyllis, her only living child, Terrell was elected for a third term and a final term as NACW pres president. She relied on her own mother's generous care of her daughter to simultaneously run the NACW, serve as the first black woman on the board of education and sustain a happy family life. From her teenage years, Terrell also supported women's voting rights. So this is a part of the talk where I'm going to get into some detail about her as a suffragist. And I um, just want to let you know that I'm going to have a kind of bracketed section on that because it's been really important around the 100th anniversary of women's voting rights. And I've been doing a lot of talks on it. Um, and I still think it's relevant to keep talking about this aspect of her. And basically, as an adult, she recorded in her diary that she had attended a talk by Mrs. Pankhurst, the militant suffragette, exclaiming uh, that she had enjoyed her address immensely. She was really impressed by the radical protest tactics of the British suffrage movement, and she looked forward to participating in direct action in the United States. And the opportunity came first for her on March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, when Alice Paul and Lucy Burns organized a huge suffrage parade for the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And I'm going to talk about what happened with Black women at the march because it's something that most historians had missed uh, until I did my research into Mary Church Terrell's participation. White suffrage leaders, especially Alice Paul, who was a young educated, college educated uh, Quaker, tried at first to exclude and then to segregate black women at the back of the parade in order to pacify uh, Southern white suffragists who they wanted to come and participate in the march. And most historical and popular culture accounts describe the anti-listing activist and suffragist Ida B. Wells Barnett and talk about her refusal to march in a segregated delegation at the back of the parade. This is true, and they rightly celebrate her defiant insertion of herself into the otherwise all-white Illinois delegation. But what is less well-known is that this was not a solitary act of one defiant woman. 
And as I was reading these accounts, I was thinking, this isn't possible that Mary Church Terrell, from what I had learned about her, would be willing to march at the back of the parade. But the implication was that all the other women capitulated. And what I found is that, in fact, many dozens of Black women, including Terrell, marched all throughout the suffrage parade in the nation's capital. Some Black suffragists marched together, and some in primarily white delegations organized by occupation or by interests. Some uh, of those who joined state delegations were indeed at the back, but only because organizers of the march had a carefully choreographed chart for the parade and planned for all the states to assemble there, including uh, Wells Barnett's Illinois. So a black Chicago newspaper captured the scene that day with a title that read, the equal suffrage parade was viewed by many thousands of people from all part of the United States. No color line existed in any part of it. Afro-American women proudly marched right by the side of the white sisters. Carol served as, oh, so I can't step in the middle or I step on the microphone cord. So I, I will straddle the cord here. Um, so uh, Terrell served as a mentor to Howard University's new Delta Sigma Theta sorority, whose members organized precisely to take an active role in politics and reform movements, starting with their desire to participate in the march. So Terrell, who wrote the oath for the Deltas and became an honorary lifetime member, negotiated with Alice Paul on their behalf. The members wanted to march together, but the key question was whether they could march along with the other contingents of college women from all the other uh, colleges. And a telegraph on the, uh, from the National American Women's Suffrage Association to Alice Paul on the day of the parade capitulated to the pressure Black women had placed on the organization, agreeing that Black suffragists could march without restrictions. Terrell explained that, when some of the white suffragists still objected to having the colored girls of Howard University march in the parade, it was Terrell's friend, the lawyer and suffragist Inez Mulholland, who insisted that, be, that they be given a place along with the other pupils of the other schools. The 25 Howard University Deltas marched alongside the other college delegations dressed in their caps and gowns and not at the back. Mary Beard, who was a feminist and a progressive U.S. historian, invited Terrell and the other NACW members to, quote, stride alongside the New York City Woman, Woman Suffrage Party, which they did. Black women even carried the state banners for New York and Mich Michigan. And as Carrie Clifford's recounted in the NAACP's The Crisis, Black suffragists marched as uh, artists, homemakers, trained nurses, teachers, doctors, writers, club women, college graduates, college students, musicians, and others. An editorial by NACW, I mean, sorry, uh, NAACP leader W.E.B. Du Bois described the politics surrounding the participation of Black suffragists. The Women's Suffrage Party had a hard time settling the status of Negroes in the Washington Parade. Finally, an order went out to segregate them in the parade, but telegrams and protests poured in, and eventually the colored women marched according to their state and occupation without let or hindrance. Du Bois captured the fluidity and chaos of the situation, as well as the resolve of the Black women who organized, protested, and won the capitulation of the white suffragists. And it, I think that if we better understood that Black suffragists collectively fought for and won the right to participate throughout, we would have a different story to tell of Black women's pivotal role in the suffrage movement. We did make some strides in telling the story during the recent 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, but when I watch and read some popular culture, I still see that the myths and uh, confusion regarding Black women's participation still appear regularly, and uh, I'm hoping that sometime they'll figure it out and change that narrative. Um, but after the march, Terrell continued to challenge Alice Paul. She was determined to explain Black women voters' perspectives and experiences to white women, especially the demand that white suffragists fight against the disenfranchisement of Black men. Um, so Terrell joined Alice Paul's National Women's Party in order to persistently call on the organization to collaborate with Black suffragists to resist all violations of voting rights. 
Despite their differences, Terrell especially admired Paul's use of direct action. So during World War I, she and her daughter Phyllis, then in her late teens, were among the uh, only a few black women who are documented so far as having joined in a peacefully picketing in front of the White House. Carrying banners calling for women's voting rights, Terrell willingly risked arrest and violent attacks. The women who picketed were called traitors because they were protesting the US government policies during wartime. Also during World War I, Terrell advocated broader employment opportunities for black women. Whenever they could, African Americans tried to gain greater access to stable jobs in the federal government because those would be the best paying jobs they could find. Terrell and her daughters applied for a variety of clerical and office jobs, hoping that the wartime expansion of the federal workforce could get them into doors that were usually shut to black men and women. Like most educated black women, they did not have a wide range of career options beyond teaching. And then this profession was closed to Mary Church Terrell because married women were not allowed to teach. Despite the wartime need for employees and despite their qualifications, Terrell and her daughter were, uh, was op were openly denied most employment opportunities explicitly based on their race. So people would um, bring them in, realize that they were black and deny them the um, opportunity to work. It, in, on the other hand, when they did get employed, they invariably countered, encountered prejudice. In 1917, for instance, Terrell was hired but then fired from the War Risk Insurance Bureau when white women openly protested having to work with her. Then she found a new job at the Census Bureau, but then she quit in protest over the humiliating segregation of the women's restrooms. So in the end, most black women found manual labor jobs during the war. Disturbed by the discriminatory em employment environment that sh she had seen, but knew were affecting black women workers um, across the board during World War I, Terrell helped create the Women Wage Earners Association of Washington, DC in 1917. Black women were usually excluded from white dominated labor unions. So this new group encouraged them to organize, unionize and place uh, demand workplace protections and decent wages. Terrell formed the group with other NACW leaders arguing, our women wage earners are a large factor in the life of the race. They are becoming more so every day as the business interests of the race expand and the demand for intelligent workers grows with the expansion. Unfortunately, black men and women's employment prospects and the conditions of their employment in the federal government did not improve as African Americans expected in the 1920s. This is the case even though newly enfranchised black women voters had largely supported the Republican Party in the 1920 presidential election. Now, this may be confusing, but they did so because they still identified the Republican Party as the party of Lincoln. And so, uh, you know, even though they voted for the Republicans and the Republicans had gained the, regained the presidency and Congress from Democratic President Woodrow Wilson, who had implemented federal segregation, uh, it turns out that the Republicans refused to pass the anti-lynching legislation that black activists had been demanding for decades. And then furthermore, African-Americans continued to face hostility from white government workers, as well as segregation on the job, just as they had during uh, Wilson's administration. So to deal with the fact that Mary Church Terrell lived a really long time. I'm going to jump ahead to the Great Depression to discuss how black women again hoped that they might gain access to federal jobs. This time, it was not because of a wartime expansion of positions, but because of the creation of new G deal agencies um, as a response to the Great Depression under the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a Democrat. And so in 1933, a 70-year-old Mary Church Terrell secured work as a clerk in the Division of Emergency Relief. Yet within a year, she was fired. Her boss revealed that it was her civil rights activism outside of work that was the problem. He noted that Terrell's presence raised the hackles of her white 
supervisors and coworkers saying, Mrs. Terrell, they say that you belong to the NAACP, that you write for colored newspapers, and that you are critical. Uh, all three of these complaints had nothing to do with the quality of her work, but focused on Terrell's prominence within the African American community as a reformer, civil rights activist, and journalist. It also does highlight her will willingness to be critical at work uh, to oppose her own working conditions, low pay, and especially the discriminatory segregation and race racist slights that she experienced from coworkers and supervisors alike. In fact, her employer's charges, though irrelevant for assessing the quality of her work, were in fact true. In the 1930s, as in earlier decades, Terrell was deeply involved in a number of important civil rights causes, including with the NAACP, the organization that she had helped found in 1909. During the Depression era, while Terrell was a government employee, she served as chair on the Commission Committee of Charities for the NAACP's uh, DC branch, became secretary of its Committee on Finance, and was a member of its Committee on Education. She also served as NAACP branch speaker, willing to fill impromptu requests for lecturers from anyone who had pressing civil rights issues that they wanted her to address. And in addition, she served as a member and a treasurer of the local NAACP's interracial committee, which focused on racial discrimination in the DC public schools, one of her longtime concerns. But Terrell was also serving at this exact same time while working full time as secretary of the Committee uh, on Race Relations of the Washington Federation of Churches. In 1934, the group undertook several key projects, including improving the condition of housing for African Americans in the district and exploring the question of how to prevent race riots by rampaging whites. It also protested the recent lynching of George Armwood, a black Maryland man, through a letter writing campaign and by having its members, including Terrell, testify at the uh, US House Committee hearings on anti-lynching legislation. The Committee on Race Relations' biggest undertaking in 1934 was its support of the only black representative in Congress, Oscar de Priest, in his attempt to allow African Americans to eat in the House cafeteria along with the white public. Terrell had long resisted segregation in cafeterias and restaurants and eagerly participated in this campaign. And as a side note, um, I discovered that something that nobody had ever discovered before, which is that she had an affair with him after her husband died. Um, so that was kind of exciting. So I have a chapter on uh, their later life partnership. Um, but Terrell's vision of how to achieve change was broad and multifaceted. So throughout her long life as an activist, she had often attended multiple meetings of different organizations every single day, each week. So while she was in the NAACP and on this Committee on Race Relations, she also joined in cross-class collaborations with groups like the New Negro Alliance. She participated in its direct action protests by picketing stores in the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign. The New Negro Alliance protests successfully uh, pressured store owners where, that were in black neighborhoods owned by whites, but were refusing to hire black workers. So the goal in that case was to hire black workers. And Terrell's participation is reminiscent of her civic activism during World War I when she had organized black women workers to improve their conditions. And similarly, Terrell was also an active member of a group that was left-leaning feminist group called the League of Women Shoppers. And they supported the labor movement by organizing under the slogan, use your buying power for justice. And the league supported workers' strikes and boycotts and pressured store owners to provide better pay and safer working conditions for laborers. And this very same year, in 1934, Terrell was also involved in left-wing protests on behalf of the Scottsboro Nine, the nine Alabama teenagers who, in 1931, had been falsely accused of the gang rape of two white women and sentenced to death. 
their plight remained a priority for civil rights activists because they remained on uh, in jail even though the white women recanted. The NAACP had actually declined to represent them because it generally avoided the controversies surrounding the defense of black men accused of raping white women. Instead, it was playing a safer long-term game of focusing on a legal campaign to end segregation. But the Communist Party's international labor defense took up the cases of the Scottsboro Nine. And during the Great Depression, this was partially because the Communist International, or Comintern, began to emphasize fighting fascism and working with non-communist allies through its popular front strategy in America. So instead of focusing on the immediate overthrow of capitalism, the communist left began using the rhetoric of and valorization of black mothers and their families to support the black freedom struggle in the US. And the international labor defense managed because of this to gain the goodwill of non-communist African-Americans by championing poor black defendants. So Mary Church Terrell, who was not a communist, but had already written many articles and speeches against the unjust convictions of the Scottsboro Nine, uh, accepted the invitation in this case of William L. P Patterson, who was an African-American attorney and the Communist Party leader of the International Labor Defense, to work alongside them. And so she ended up leading a delegation of women accompanying five Scottsboro mothers to the White House on Mother's Day, where they intended to ask President Roosevelt to intervene, to exercise his moral power, to put an end to the machinations of the legal lynchers of the South. An indifferent President Roosevelt refused to meet with them or to send a high-ranking official in his stead. So Terrell shared uh, William Patterson's negative assessment of the failure on the part of the president to meet with these grief-stricken mothers gives moral support to the lynchers. When Mary Church Terrell looked back on her time working in New Deal agencies, she noted that she had always been the only black woman in the various New Deal offices in which she had worked. She concluded that she was fired because of her race. I am well aware that the inability to secure employment for its citizens without regard to race, religion, or sex is a vexatious problem. But the average broad-minded citizen in this country does not realize that for every difficulty experienced by a white woman or a white man seeking a way to his, earn his or her daily bread, at least 50 times that many confront his brothers and sisters of a darker hue. Despite the difficulties and indignities endured by Terrell and other African Americans, she and other fellow activists opened doors and took important steps toward racial equality in the federal workplace. And also she personally found a lot of ways to protest in more direct action protests against um, employment discrimination and a whole range of civil rights issues even while she was working. Um, so then I'm going to jump ahead again, <laughs> because otherwise I'll never get through this, uh, into when she was in her late 80s. And at that point, Terrell began the leadership of a major desegregation campaign in 1949. She and other uh, activists had learned of the District of Columbia's Reconstruction Era anti-discrimination laws from the 1872 and 1873, and found that they had never actually been overturned by uh, the lawmakers. So Terrell chaired a committee of a Communist Party-sponsored organization called the Civil Rights Congress. And the committee had a long name. It was the Coordinating Committee for the Enforcement of the DC Anti-Discrimination Laws. And in that context, Terrell declared, I felt that I would go through fire and water for us as colored people not to be treated as animals. The committee brought together more than 100 civic, social, and labor organizations. Without someone of Terrell's organizational skill and recognized prominence at its head, it is doubtful that such a large set of groups could have been held together. It used a variety of actions, including lawsuits, negotiations, sit-ins, boycotts, and picketing to force businesses to desegregate. 
These were the tools that Terrell and her civil rights activists had long utilized in the past, but that became more common in the civil rights movement a couple of years later, during and after the 1955 Montgomery bus, Alabama bus boycott that was led by Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. Never one to shrink from a task because of her age or the prospect of public humiliation, um, Terrell organized an interracial group of DC residents to try to be served at Thompson's restaurant. She asked a black Baptist minister, a black woman who was a cafeteria worker and a union organizer, and a white Quaker man to go with her. After, as they expected, uh, the interracial group was refused service, attorneys in the left-leaning uh, National Labor, uh, uh, sorry, National Lawyers Guild, which was the first racially integrated bar association, they sued on their behalf. And what we see is that the legal climate had grown more favorable to civil rights uh, challenges. Lawyers like Thurgood Marshall from the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund had been urging the Supreme Court to take seriously the equal protection and due process clauses of the 14th Amendment. So finally, their arguments, those long patient strategy was starting to take hold. A year after the desegregation cam campaign in DC began, but not before it ended, Terrell praised the Supreme Court's 1950 decisions in McLaurin v. Oklahoma and Sweat v. Painter, which opened up institutions of higher education to African Americans on the basis of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Anticipating the court's 1954 decision in Brown v. Board of Education, Terrell called for these decisions to be extended and applied to elementary and secondary schools, saying that it was unfortunate and embarrassing that the greatest democracy on earth continues to deny black children their rights. When she was invited to explain to a group of white women why activists were picketing at Kruger's department store, she stated it clearly. White women are allowed to sit while eating lunch, but colored women are forced to stand up. This is done to humiliate them and to brand them as second class citizens. Now, their strategies varied because sometimes just simply publicizing the unequal treatment quickly affected the bottom line of dime store uh, chains that had lunch counters. So some of these people decided to change their policies immediately. Others did so within eight to 10 weeks of the protest beginning. But if owners and managers refused to negotiate and change their policies, the committee threatened to boycott their businesses. Picketing was the final strategy used to force a business's capitulation, and it was a difficult step for the committee to make. Uh, for example, even after the Kresge department store refused to buckle in the face of a boycott, which was very successful at keeping people out of the store, uh, the committee had a contentious internal debate about whether or not to picket. Some argued that picketing was undignified and dangerous. But Terrell did understand their concerns, but she argued that it was crucial to do whatever it could, they could to force recalcitrant companies to change. As a fellow activist recalled, turning a deaf ear to last minute warnings of impending race riots and violence that would result, Terrell put on her fur coat, wrapped a scar around her head, and with her cane in one hand and a picket sign in the other, led the first uh, detachments of pickets in a snowstorm. Noting the anti-discrimination law's guarantee of equal service to all respectable, well-behaved persons, she and other protesters made a point of always wearing their Sunday best. After eight weeks of picketing, Kresge's gave in. When uh, Murphy's department store, I said Kruger's before, there were a bunch of different stores, so um, I'm probably mixing those two up in my shortened talk. But when Murphy's department store continued to discriminate against African-American customers, the coordinating committee also sent picketers to march out front. And the elderly Terrell was sometimes found it a little physically difficult to participate. So her compatriots uh, staffed the picket line. And then this is another quote, with Mrs. Terrell watching them from a little canvas chair, like a fond teacher observing a group of her favorite pupils. 
Each week, different groups, including the NAACP and churches, took turns on the picket line. Even when dealing with serious issues, Terrell said, I can always see something funny. And in this case, she laughed to herself when she went up and talked to the manager and told him how wicked it was for him not to let me have a piece of pie at the counter. And after more than four months of picketing, the manager finally phoned Terrell personally to capitulate, inviting her to have a coffee and pie uh, as his treat. But as Ella Baker later reminded students who were forming the non Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, in 1960, Terrell knew that it was bigger than a hamburger or bigger than a piece of pie. As they conducted their direct action protests, the Thompson's restaurant case that she initiated by going in that integrated group uh, made its way through the courts. And in 1953, the US Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the anti-discrimination ordinances were still in effect. So they won. Um, and they won the year before Brown v. Board of Education. And Terrell was thrilled. She said, I will be 90 on the 23rd of September you will note that we are on the 23rd of September, so this is Mary Church Terrell's birthday, um, and will die happy that children of my group will not grow up thinking that they are inferior because they are deprived of rights which children of other racial groups enjoy. The coordinating committee appealed to African Americans to make full use of their rights in order to ensure that all of the stores and restaurants actually complied with the decision. So it emphasized that every customer must be given equal ac access and respect, and then they kind of tracked it to make sure people were following it. To celebrate her 90th birthday, Terrell and the committee decided to push for the broadest possible interpretation of the Supreme Court decision by announcing that an integrated group of four friends would accompany Terrell to dinner and a movie because they hadn't targeted the movie theaters and other theaters. Understanding the implications of the court's rulings, as well as the threat of an impending desegregation campaign, each of the still segregated DC theaters, movie and play um, capitulated. So Terrell's coordinating committee had rid the nation's capital of overt discrimination in public facilities and proved the value of direct action tactics combined with a legal assault on discrimination. Subsequent campaigns, including the Montgomery boycott, bus boycott that began the year after Terrell's death, used many of the same methods that had proved successful in Washington, D.C. Yet the D.C. fight was unique in the civil rights movement because it was run entirely at the top by women rather than by black male ministers. Um, the other thing about the D.C. decision is that it didn't have the same impact because it only applied to D.C. Um, because of the way that uh, it's a it's a separate entity. Um, so that's why it didn't have a kind of national ramifications that Brown B, B. Board did. But it did show where the court was going. Um, so now I'd like to shift a little bit to make one more point about Terrell's activism. Her respectability, light skin color and class status enabled Mary Church Terrell to enter into white spaces and dare to speak truth to power. She knew this and she used her privilege repeatedly and publicly to condemn the mistreatment and sexual abuse of black women at the hands of white men and in the criminal justice system. So in 1912, for instance, Terrell met with the Virginia governor to defend the life of a poor black teenager Virginia Christian, who had been sentenced to death in the electric chair for accidentally killing the white woman who hired her as a domestic servant. Terrell was able to visit Christian in prison and to mobilize NACW and NAACP protests against the death penalty for this very young girl, but she was unable to stop the execution. Again, after the 1919 Washington DC race riots, Terrell approached the prosecutor to defend another black teenager, Carrie Johnson, from the fa uh, false charge of murder after her family's home was invaded by white, gun-wielding, plainclothes police officers, and um, the, one of the police officers was killed, so she was sentenced to death too. And in 1953, she met with Georgia's governor as part of her leadership of a campaign that I didn't even talk about that was going on at this exact same time from uh, 49 to 54 
uh, to defend a poor black sh sharecropper named Rosalie Ingram, who was also condemned to death with two of her sons for trying to defend herself against a violent predatory white neighbor. Terrell met with the Ingrams in prison, met with the governor, uh, organized a huge petition campaign, and spoke at the United Nations, saying that the Ingrams case was just one example of how the United States was systematically violating the UN's Declaration of Human Rights. So in these examples spread over several decades, Terrell's approach and goals were the same. She advocated on behalf of those who had far less privilege and far fewer claims to respectability than she did. She entered governor's mansions and prisons, seeing imprisoned women as worthy of respect and as victims of an unjust legal, legal system that were based, was based on maintaining white supremacy. Terrell's activism is in line with today's movements, such as Kimberly Crenshaw's African American Policy Forum's hashtag movement, Say Her Name, which aims to add to the Black Lives Matter movement by bringing specific attention to police violence against Black women like Sandra Bland, Tanisha Anderson, and Breonna Taylor, among others. So that's what I have for you today, and thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'll come back to you, okay? <laughs> there are lots of hands. Thank you. I was wondering if, if she ever ran for office. That's a great question. The question is, did she ever run for political office? And the answer is no, but she wanted to. And she said she would have loved to be a senator. I think if she had really had her way, she would have liked to be president. But um, what happened was that because she was a resident of the District of Columbia, even after she helped win the right to vote for women, she couldn't vote because all residents of the District of Columbia couldn't vote. Um, as you know, you might see signs in DC. I think the license plates say taxation without representation. Um, and so, you know, they're still unhappy about that and there is a statehood movement. Um, the other thing that happened though, is that when she, in 1929, she, ha she had been working for the decade after women got the right to vote uh, as a Republican GOP political campaigner. So she would go out and campaign for all of the presidential candidates on the Republican side uh, during the 1920s. And like I said, this is the party of Lincoln, and that's what uh, the great majority of African Americans continue to vote for the Republicans until about halfway through uh, FDR's administration, and then there's a slow shift toward the Democratic Party, which of course gets much bigger over time. But in any case, she goes to Illinois to help uh, a woman named Ruth Hannah McCormick, who is a Republican Illinois representative and who is a white woman, and she is going to run for Senate. And so Terrell becomes the head of her campaign for uh, for talking to colored voters, right? So they they hired, oh, sorry, they had a, a white campaign head and a black campaign head. And I think they actually had two for men as well. So she was in charge of colored women's votes is what they called it at the time. And so uh, in that context, she does talk about how she hopes that the fact that a white woman might be able to get into the Senate would be a stepping stone for other women to get there too. But um, McCormick did not win. She won her primary, but she did not win in the general election. And it took another 30 or maybe it was even 40 plus years for a woman to enter the Senate. Um, so, so she was a little ahead of her time. Um, I'll bring the microphone up to the front. Um, I also just want to say if there's anyone who would like to ask a question but maybe not be filmed, if you want to write it out and give it to me, that's fine as well. I'll just wait at the back between questions. Uh, why is Terrell important today and what can uh, current political movements learn from her life? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, um, why would is it important to know about her today and what can current 
contemporary movements learn from learning about her life. And one of the things that I think is important to understand is that political organizing and social change and civil rights do not happen at one particular moment. Um, it's a long process and uh, part of the idea of um, calling up the unceasing militancy that uh, Paul Robeson was talking about was also that it's not like you go to one protest or you go to one summer's worth of protests or that you think that, you know, it's not true that Rosa Parks was a tired old seamstress who just sat down. And there have been historians who fortunately have helped us unpack that story where it turns out that, um, you know, just like Terrell, she was a woman who had been active in the NAACP, had gone to the Highlander Folk School and had training um, from kind of communist left wing labor union organizers and how to do civil disobedience long before she sat on that bus. So uh, it, or maybe not long before, I think it was actually like in that year, but you get the picture. She'd been doing work for a really long time. And so I do think persistence and um, a refusal to give up is actually really important. And I think if a current generation understands that you have to have that persistence that that's probably useful and maybe it doesn't feel good because it's i'm saying it's a long game but um but that's what i think she tells us among other things thanks alice and that, that was wonderful uh as you w well know brockport's first black uh, alum, Fanny Barrier Williams was also very, very prominent. Okay. And I'm wondering whether, uh, one, whether you know whether they had any kind of contact, and second, whether they were on the same side uh, uh, among the political factions uh, of, of the time. Uh, she was, well, class of 1870. Oh, <laughs> how'd you, how'd you, how'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. So um, I was very proud to be here when we had the unveiling of the plaque that is on the outside of what's called, if you look at the stone up at the top, the old teacher's college, right? Because Brockport was a teacher's college and Fanny Barrier Williams um, went there. So it's across from the alumni house is where you can see this. And this was a plaque that talks about her as a civil rights activist, as the first African-American graduate of Brockport no Normal School, class of 1870. And then this is a quote from her where she says, one of the most wonderful things in human history is how eagerly these suddenly liberated women tried to lay hold upon all there is in human existence. This constant striving for equality has given upward direction to all the activities of colored women. And they absolutely did know each other and work together in the National Association of Colored Women. Um, they were both very much involved in that and um, their paths intersected and overlapped uh, many a time. There was a time when uh, Fanny Barrier Williams, I think she lived for a little while in DC, uh, then she moved to Chicago. But um, th this is something that I was very proud that we could get this done and honor her on campus. And so I did sneak that slide in and I was kind of hoping that someone might mention her. <laughs> so thank you, Elizabeth. I was like, oh good, I get to use my slide. <laughs> so, but so make sure you go around uh, to, uh, it's Hartwell Hall, right? The front of Hartwell and Hall. And so go to the front of Hartwell Hall. I was thinking, oh, I hope I got the name wrong, uh, uh, right. It's been two and a half years, <laughs> did I forget? But fortunately I even remembered the name of the hall. So um, so yeah, so that that is a, a really nice connection. And a lot of these club women knew each other, of course, um, in some ways it was a relatively small group of leaders because she was a leader. Um, there were many, many thousands of members, but um, the leading club women um, were all these educated women, which was quite rare at the time. Um, and when I said that Terrell was the first black woman to get a college degree, the truth is I think I should be more accurate to say she got a bachelor's degree because women before that time who, who were black and most white women were getting a different degree. They were basically getting either kind of a teaching certificate kind of thing, or they were getting what we would call an AA degree, like an associates of arts degree. And what they called it at Oberlin is a ladies degree 
and a gentleman's degree. And so she insisted on getting the four year ladies degree. And she was actually told if you get the ladies degree, you'll never get married because no man's gonna wanna marry you. And no man will be able to speak Latin and Greek like you do, so you're out of luck. And she was really mad and she said, well, you know, I'm just gonna take my chances. So she went ahead and learned um, Latin and Greek and she actually in the end knew five languages fluently. And um, when she went to DC and started working at the, um, it was called the M Street uh, Colored School for high school, uh, she ended up meeting Robert Terrell. And Robert Terrell had also been born into slavery but uh, he, he actually was a little bit older. So he was seven years old when the Civil War ended and, Fran and uh, Mary Church Terrell was a baby. So in any event, um, oh, not a baby, two years old. Um, depends on how you look at it. Uh, she wasn't an infant by then. But the point is, he turns out to have been the head of the Latin department at this school and he had managed somehow to get himself from enslavement in Virginia to Harvard University, where he had gotten a degree. Um, and so they were actually quite well matched and he was not the slightest bit threatened by her education and he encouraged her public career. So one of the things that I really enjoyed finding out about was about her personal private life and her love life and was able to get access to those letters when um, I was, talking at a conference with another scholar who focused on, um, I don't know if I'm pushing things around, um, but it, you know, t focusing on um, Terrell and her husband. And he said that there were still love letters at her family's house in Highland Beach, Maryland, which was a black beach resort that um, Frederick Douglass's son, uh, Charles had created. And so what's interesting about that is that she ended up living in a house next door to Frederick Douglass's house in Highland Beach. And I was able to go to the Douglass house and the Terrell house. And the Douglass house today is a museum. The Terrell's house is, is a private home, but they set me up with all of the couple's love letters in the Douglass house. And so I was able to sit in Frederick Douglass's house and read the love letters between Robert and Mary Terrell, which was just unbelievable. And one part of her diary that I was reading while I was there, looking out at the Chesapeake Bay, said, woke up this morning and looked out at the gorgeous view of the Chesapeake Bay. And I, I was just like, you know, that's pretty incredible. But the other thing that was so amazing about it is that on the uh, Frederick Douglass house, there was a sign uh, that talks about how he had said, because um, he was quite elderly at the time and he never ended up actually living there, uh, although his family members did. Um, he said, um, I want to look out as a free man in a home that I own, looking across to the uh, Eastern shore of Maryland where I was enslaved as a child. And so that was kind of the goal of having this um, place to live that would be safe and also would be a kind of a sign of their rejection of slavery and of um, their inferior treatment. Um, so in the context of all of that, um, part of the book is more personal. So I was talking to you about the activist side, but there's also a lot of um, materials about her private life as well. Okay, so we've got a couple questions. Lauren, did you have your hand up? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. So Mindy, and then I saw your hand again. And anyone else who wants the mic, just give me like a little, a little signal and I'll, signal and I'll So thank you for that very engaging talk. You've given me a lot to think about and a new perspective through which to view suffrage archives. Okay. I've, in your research, did you come across any evidence of black women's party suffragists picketing going to jail like Alice Paul did? And if so, were they segregated? Um, did I find any evidence of what? The black suffragist picketers from the White House going to prison. Oh, no, um, no. Uh, she actually in her so that I only have evidence of the Mary Church Terrell 
her daughter, and then a woman named Kathleen Canning wrote a new book and found a third person. So, so far we only know three documented cases. I'm not saying that that's it, but that's what we know so far in a you know documentable way. Um, so we have three cases, and Mary Church Tell talks in her memoir about how she went to Pickett one day uh, and then got called away to another meeting. So she didn't go, and that day a lot of the women who went were arrested. And so she talks about how she um, missed being arrested, <laughs> but um, she she didn't end up, you know, because it didn't happen every day. <laughs> so, so she didn't happen to be there on one of those days. And she actually talks about another case in Dover, Delaware, you know, uh, now that I teach at the University of Delaware, I have told this story there, where she was a a GOP um, campaigner and went in 1920, right when women got the vote, just to, to you know round up support for the uh, Harding, and um, she was arrested, or they tried to arrest her at the train station for disorderly conduct because she basically said, "I'm looking for the Republican meeting," <laughs> and the the ticket agent was so mad that you know a black woman voter was coming to rally other voters that uh, he tried to get her arrested. And she said she wanted to talk to other black men advisors about whether um, she should pursue charges or like complain about what happened. And, and they were all just like, oh, thank goodness you didn't get arrested in the end. Thank goodness they just, you know, they didn't press charges. Just let it all go. And she was saying, I would have liked to ha be, have been arrested because then I could have really publicized, you know, how bad the treatment is of black women in, you know, Dover, Delaware. Um, so, so I don't think she was afraid of it, um, but it didn't happen. I am curious about the men married to these women who were out front. What was their makeup? And were they intimidated by the women? It, it really depends on the man. Um, so obviously it is true that most of these women were married to men who were also black leaders in their own right, whether they were judges or lawyers or educators. Um, you know, Margaret Murray Washington was the wife of um, Booker T. Washington. You know, so a lot of these uh, women had very prominent, uh, they were part of the black elite. Um, some of the men were dismissive of what they did and um, gave them a bit of a hard time about it. Some of them understood that more, more, more black men than white men understood that voting rights were something that all people needed, right? And that if it, the arguments against black men's voting rights were kind of the same arguments against black women's voting rights or all women's voting rights. So they, you know, even from back to Douglas again, to the universal suffrage concept, right, where you support everybody, adult people's right to vote. Um, so there was more support in the black community for voting rights for women than in the white community, especially earlier. But there were men who were um, less you know, less accepting of it. And especially the level of um, publicity and public life that Mary Church Terrell, her role, that not every man was as accept accepting of that um, because she really, she, she ended up traveling um, on the black and white. And I say it that way because they were separate. Like she would go on lecture tours and speak to white people. And then she would go on lecture tours and speak to black people. And that's, they were the black and white lecture circuits are separate things. Um, but she would do both. And um, a lot of the black men who knew Robert Terrell would say, why would you let her do that? You know, like she should be at home. So there were those kind of patriarchal attitudes. Um, but of course, just like anything, it's a mix, right? Allison, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask my own question. I'm wondering what you can tell us about her funeral, what that meant to the civil rights movement in the 1954, I think she passed yeah. away. And then, you know, what has been the memory of her in the civil rights community in subsequent decades, maybe before historians like you started doing academic research about her? Uh huh. I mean, in some ways, she's been very well known in the sense that um, she was as the first president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and as the uh, founding honorary member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, she's quite well known and embraced within those communities. And so, you know, when I give talks in um, 
uh, settings where there are a lot more black women in the audience, a lot of them will be wearing red, which is the Delta color. So like supporting the, the you know, their soror. So, um, so she's not ever been unknown. Um, but what has happened is that people focused almost entirely on that period at the turn of the century. And in some cases, we're kind of critical of her for um, the slogan that you saw on the purple banners that said, lifting as we climb. And the notion being that that sounded kind of middle class and um, patronizing to black women who were poor. And so part of what I was trying to argue and what I found out is that I don't actually agree with that. And especially if you look at the long trajectory of her life, she's doing labor union organizing, she's going to prisons. She is not a snob, you know? And like basically she had kind of a bad reputation in some ways as somebody who was an elitist. And so that was part of, and, and not to say that she wasn't super elite, right? But I don't know that she was also an elitist. So there is a difference. And so I'm not trying to deny that she was part of the black elite, uh, the so-called, you know, uh, W.B. Du Bois is 10%, um, but, or what do you call it? The talented 10th is what he said. Um, basically arguing that there should be a, a, a number of people, at least 10% of the population of African Americans who would have the same kind of professional education uh, jobs, you know, all the kind of stuff that um, elite whites would have. So, uh, you know, she was part of that. Um, but so that's really what I was trying to get at is, is the fact that that narrow look at a 91 year life um, is not a super great way of looking at her. And so it was um, really fun to be able to get into the whole thing. So. So maybe we could take one more question and then leave some time if people want to come and talk individually with Allison. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Okay, well then I'm going to thank Dr. Parker, Dr. Masaryk, who's back there for thank introducing you. her. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming this evening. And um, uh, Dr. Parker will be around for a little while if people would like to approach her and, and chat a little bit. Thank you all again. Have a good night.